Well, hello and welcome to Comms Hero. This is a conversation hosted by myself, Tom Gaymore. It's about policing communications and social media in today's uh, day and age. We've got a wonderful panel of guests as well. We've got Harry Tangi, who it's fair to say pioneered social media down <laughs> in his Devon and Cornwall. Uh, area that he was based at. He's now retired. We've got Nick Knowles, who is a big advocate of police officers and their work nationally, but also has a, a real interest in, in the media world through his work. We've got Nick Adderley, who is a serving chief constable from North Hans Police and a marketing expert, Sophia Can. So uh, thank you everyone for joining me. We're going to have a, a fabulous chat, I'm sure, over the next 60 minutes. And I think this is a, a topic that is really important. Police legitimacy is being challenged and has been challenged over the last couple of years, it's fair to say. And that extends to the online world as well. It's a hard fix in terms of the online community. And I'd like to open up my questioning to Nick being a serving chief constable. What do you see, and this is a broad question, what do you see as the police's role in terms of the digital world? What, what is policing's role and how can it communicate with its communities and the people that police officers serve? We can't hear you, Nick. Yeah, I'm just checking in. Can are you on mute, Nick? No, he's not on mute. No. So we just just wait to hear from Nick. I will pass that whilst we fix Nick's uh, connection. I will pass that question on to Harry because you were involved in spearheading Devon and Cornwall's engagement, if you like, digitally. How did you see your role? And what was the reasons for you getting involved in social media as a police officer? Yeah. Um, hi, Tom. Thank you. I, basically, it all started with me, really, when uh, I was doing, I was part of the traffic department armed response. And so I was doing a bit of road safety stuff. Uh, and a video went a little bit viral, if you like. And I got a little bit of interest. And it was really good. Uh, and my force probably regret it to this very day, suggested that I might start a, an account, a social media account. Um, and uh, they said, you can either change your own one or you can start a new one and have your own private. But they were a little bit nervous about talking about too much policing on private accounts, which sure have I understood. Well, I, I didn't want to waste those 60 followers I had on my own account. So I changed mine to, to the fourth account. Um, and they, they, it, if it wasn't for them, I wouldn't be here now. So it was because of that leadership. Sean Sawyer um, uh, was and um, Paul Nethercott, um, Netherton rather, Paul Netherton and, Ch uh, and Sean Sawyer were the command team, the, the chief constable in debt. Phenomenal support um, because they realised that you're not going to please all the people all the time. And where I think other people have sort of panicked a little bit and shut people down, um, I was sort of given a little bit of top cover but I had to play by the rules. What it does for me is like an additional form of neighborhood policing. If you're going down the street and you see a window open and there's uh, an elderly lady just walking out of the house, you might say, oh, do you want to put that window shut sort of thing? You're giving a little bit of advice or whatever. You're also actually finding criminals because you get people up there that uh, badly required, needed and wanted by forces for serious offenses. So the word goes out there. You can also have a little bit of human humour as long as it's sort of, you know, it's respectable, like you would a police officer in uniform over the garden fence with somebody having a chat, having a bit of a chuckle. It it's, does that neighbourhood policing. But then I can sort of contact thousands of people in a day as opposed to one, two and three. But you'll never beat the boots on the ground neighbourhood policing, though. And Nick... From your perspective as a member of the public, but somebody with a, with a huge amount of media experience, what do you see policing's role in the digital world to be? And do you know should policing have a uh, integral part in, in well should social media form an integral part of their communications? 
Yeah, it absolutely should. I mean, interestingly, I got involved uh, in, um, I actually met Harry when uh, he got a bit of flack from the newspapers after posting uh, a social media post. He'd been dealing with a massive traffic back up and once he'd finished and got the road moving, he took a quick uh, snap of himself with the traffic going by underneath saying, for those of you in the queue waiting, um, just to let you know, we've got the front moving again, so it won't be long before you get underway. One of the newspapers, Nationals picked it up and said, uh, police say they're busy, but the cop still has time to take selfie. Uh, so I got stuck into the press, uh, the relevant press, and um, and and said, you know, try try to keep the sort of play, playground insults out of this. Actually, he was doing a val valuable service to people stuck in the queue and actually engaging with people and letting them know what was going on ahead and actually saying pretty much get yourself prepared because... As you know, but people will switch off their engines. They're like they'll oh. sort of a, a picnic, and so I was able to sort of I don't know really just put a a, a positive view um, uh, to something that Harry had, was getting some flat for at that stage. That's true, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, uh, you were what you did was start the reasons why other people should then join in and support me because there was quite an influential person who's trusted and loved on our screens nick and um <clears throat> but who is respected and m very quickly after that the head of my professional standards um who's still is a wonderful man um he then backed me up and said carry on with what you're doing that then led to other senior officers and other forces to say yeah I support this this is really good so sort of Nick helped to turn the tide on that and just allow other people to yeah he's right you know I'm going to say something now because I feel as though I'm not going to be ambushed by everyone so yeah it was I'd, I don't think it would happen now would it Nick do you think that newspaper headline uh, I don't know. I, I think it wouldn't be quite so childish a headline. I mean, it's still a, it still happens occasionally where um, you get silly responses to the police, you know, taking a photograph of them and buying sandwiches in a shop because there are no canteens anymore. So, you know, cops have to go out and buy their food and you still get the occasional thing where, you know, should be out doing the job instead he's shopping in, you know, that, you'll always get that kind of silliness. But it's a chance for people who actually support the police and understand what they actually do on a day-to-day -day basis to speak up for them. I think it's critical for the police to actually have a voice on social media. And, I, and I'm slightly concerned about the idea that you trust your officers to go out and interact with the public uh, on a one-to-one -one basis and in the community, but you don't trust them to interact on social media. Now, I'm not unaware that some people do stupid things on social media, and we've seen cases where police have done really stupid things, at which point then, you absolutely should pull them up on it. But what you shouldn't be doing is making rules for everybody on the actions of an idiot. Because then you're treating everybody in your organisation as being incapable. And what happens is in organisations, if you start to make rules to try and stop any, any situation that might occur, <clears throat> you end up with a very turgid and slow-moving and uncommunicative um uh, business, whether it be policing or, 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 or whatever. I have a friend who's a corporate philosopher. I know that sounds like somebody you give money to uh, for no reason and they come in and do a great talk and then go <laughs> back to 10,000 pounds. Really That's the job I want. <laughs> yeah, but he, he's really interesting actually because he, what he does now these days is goes into companies and gets them to take rules out of their system. Start to trust the people that you employ because otherwise you slow everything down. You know, every, every time there's an incident, let's write another let's write another clause in the contract for that. If somebody does something that's stupid on social media, then don't we won't do social media. If somebody does something bad where we turn up, I mean, you wouldn't say somebody acted, an officer acted stupidly um, uh, uh, sorting out a road accident, so let's not do road accidents anymore. But somehow with social media, they've said, let's, because there have been examples of people doing stupid things, we can no longer trust all of our you know, 120, 130,000 officers across the country. And I think it's a really big mistake because the world is going, moving into the social media area. What you should be doing is training up your people in social media, um, not uh, stopping them from doing it altogether. I, I think you make some really good points and, and it centers around legitimacy as well. I think with, with social media that there is an element of accountability and you raised another good point around policing owning its own content it's so important for, for policing 
to be positive and on the front foot when it comes to social media, in my opinion, and not just be defensive. So it's not about challenging legitimacy or challenging uh, negative narratives. It's about actually realizing that policing owns its own content. So we see now more and more in other industries. So let's take Formula One, for example, my industry, Ferrari, if they're going to announce something, don't need the world media to announce anything. They now have their own news channels, their own engagement and their own platform through digital platforms to be able to to um, own its own content and, and its own information. And, and I think policing needs to explore that more and, and not necessarily be as reliant on external platforms, but, but view that as a collaboration and, and, and view those as, as informal partners, but actually be constantly striving to, to move forward with their own brand strategy, messaging and, and positive and, and authentic mm -hmm. content. But I, I sense a trepidation to do that because of the legitimacy and the, the challenge that, that policing sometimes faces where you find you're running around trying to please others and other opinions. I think you take from that, Nick, there. And, and, and that can be quite, uh, quite divisive and quite challenging because I don't think you'll fix that. I agree, and I think one of the interesting things is actually seeing forces saying, OK, close down all your, private, all your personal accounts and we'll take it under corporate umbrella. No, I think that's a really bad idea. What you're essentially doing then is giving tech experts and social media experts uh, the lead in police social interaction. And you can see it in some of the things that they announce that, that really aren't, aren't positive. Like, for, I, I saw a story, I'm going to get into trouble for this, but I saw a story the other day where the Met actually were thanking uh, teenage uh, teenagers for mentoring their senior officers. Which in social media speak sounds like a really good idea because it comes across really well, but it also comes across as literally, I mean, I'm not sure how, how hardened criminals and gangs in London are supposed to be, you know, supposed to be wary of senior police officers in the Met if they're being mentor, mentored by teenagers. And it, it, to, a, to a bunch of corporate um, tech people and, and social media, it sounds like a good idea, but they're not police officers. They, they're not people who deal with the difficulties that police officers do. And I think you end up with a sort of a sterile and corporate voice rather than an actual voice. And, and those people may well keep things on trend better, but it's less, um, it's less real. It's less authentic. Than well, actual what's interesting with those points, Nick, is, is you make a, a, a good... Uh, a good point around from a, a corporate perspective, you're looking at brand strategy, brand messaging, brand awareness, you know, data, engagement ratios, placement and strategy, you know, all around timing and, and that kind of stuff. And Sophia will will really pick up on some of those pillars there with, with all her experience. But there is actually an operational need for policing. We've touched on that already with the digital world providing the new neighborhood policing. Harry talked about that. It's the eyes and ears. And that's not only getting into local communities and talking to local communities, but that's also the prevent strand of policing. So you can look at uh, violence and uh, county lines, if you like, because uh, certain individuals will put their actions up on social media posts pre and post incidents and you've also got the help strands around engagement for MISPAs and local communities coming in so there's a real need for sort of a, an operational footprint and an authentic police officer footprint for the digital language but also I understand that there is a corporate sense around some of the pillars that, that I spoke about at the beginning of that sentence so Sophia let's bring you in on your understanding and you're actually working with west yorkshire at the moment uh, on some of those some of those points i am yes so i'm really torn because nick some of the points that you've made um i totally agree with um i am an ambassador of policing and pro policing um it's how i've met harry um and i think police officers should be on social media but with some good training as well, because like you said, I have seen some bad examples. Um, 
I'm sure Harry won't mind that we sometimes use your examples, don't we? In the Everyone uses this. my examples. <laughs> <laughs> well, on the good or the bad side? <laughs> or the Maybe bad. The bad. <laughs> <laughs> um, but how to do it better, we're really constructive. We don't just go in and rip them apart. We, we do look at some of the stuff and look at how we can rephrase things because we're, we're in that sort of society where people will find things offensive. We can't please everyone, but... You know, working in comms, it's our job to anticipate the next step. And when you're out there, you're probably you're doing the same as police officers. But do the public want to hear about every burglary you've gone to and things like that? I suppose it's getting the tone right because you are probably the most criticised industry. So you do have to be careful. Um, you know, Harry, you know yourself how you felt when you have put a tweet out. Um, and got a backlash. It's it's horrible. I, yeah, and I totally understand, Sophia, why um, officers don't want to gamble that because they think, well, okay, what's in it for me? Because the complaint system at the moment is that somebody has to take the call and they have to get back to the person and then they have to write it on a bit of paper and they have to look at it and it goes to the supervisor and it speaks to the officer concerned. The officer feels the bad because he was going to have a good day, but now it's a rubbish day. Uh, just to give you an idea, out of 30 years, I must have had probably about three or four complaints. Um, in the last five years, I probably had eight. Um, and it, it is a lot of stress, stress, there's a lot of pressure, and officers just don't need that. So I can sort of see why they're ducking out. So I think it has to be from both sides, really, that they have to be. And I remember somebody from comms who I didn't get on too well with uh, came with a big folder with a right, sit down. We've got a few. And his he'd left the best to last, which was me in a motorway saying, come on, guys, just slow the hell down. This is five aquaplanes that I've dealt with tonight. And the two complaints were that I'd been shouldn't be tweeting on the motorway. Um, and I said, you should look, that's my playground. So leave it with me. I can. There was plenty of safe stuff that I won't bore you with that. I was I knew I was per perfectly safe. But I said, you need to listen to the 29,998, the neutral and the positive ones and the message that that sent out and stop just prioritizing the complaints and not listening to anyone else, because that's the problem at the moment as well. It's interesting, actually, sir, because you talk about, you know, having to deal with a backlash. The backlash isn't not necessarily just because there's a backlash doesn't doesn't necessarily mean they're right. You know, 100 years ago, every village had an idiot. Now on, a, now, on, now online, they can all get together and be a community and it can look like we should be listening to them. That still, still doesn't stop them being idiots. <laughs> there is a reaction sometimes to, you know, we have to do, you can, and, and we're in a cancel culture too, where, you know, I love oranges. Well, your, your silence on pears is very telling. You know, <laughs> there's, it makes some good points there because you can only ever be responsible for what you say, not what other people hear. So what you say and what other people hear are, are two different things. And my granddad always said when I was growing up, and I'm 40 now, so it was a long time ago, we used to watch rugby at Twickenham, and he used to say, look, there's 80,000 professionals watching 30 amateurs here. And I never really understood what he meant. But, but the perception plays out now in social media where you just are cancelled out if you are a chosen professional in your field. So I work in TV. I'm a lead commentator of Formula One or Sky Sports F1's IndyCar, for example. The amount of abuse that I get when I go on TV is, is utterly staggering. And it will be the same for Nick or, you know, when Gary Lineker hosts Match of the Day. If you look at the tweets, it's what do you know, what you did, you know, and, and it's the, the, the constant undermining of expertise and experience that's a real challenge. And when we go back to police legitimacy, I think that is something that uh, the police need to look at because you will always get people that are negative towards. So I go on a lot of ride-alongs and I will post certain things and there are always negative comments around whatever that call might be. And it's really interesting. They're water off a duck's back to me, but when you see the police officers' faces, when, when you show them the comments, it, it, you know, the, the, the fear and, 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 and the panic around just negativity is 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 utterly staggering and, and and i think that that side of things is is a real challenge for policing and i think it's a real turn off for a lot of police officers like harry says to actually go and actively put their heads above the parapet and 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 have a uh, 
an account that isn't an anon account. Can I just say as well, it's really interesting watching how people deal with it, that you can, you know, you'll get, um, you'll get a response where somebody said something, a police officer said something on social media, and, and the, the social media team will say, mm, we've, had a, we've had a real backlash on, on this comment. Um, Nick Hadley, the reason I'm disappointed, Nick, Nick Hadley isn't actually in, in with us at the moment and able to chat to us is because when I see his tweet, he obviously looks mm. at what's been said and then says, do you know what, I've looked at this and I back the officer 100%. And there's not enough of that going on at the moment. A lot of, a lot, not, not enough chief constables are saying, no, I actually back my officers here. Um, the police have become a massive political football in a way they haven't been for, you know, just mm. it's terrible at the moment. They're, you know, political football, uh, easy, uh, easy clickbait for, for television and, um, and uh, print mm. papers and online, the haters are always going to hate. You know, you've got to, community of criminals out there that the police are dealing with who are always going to be negative about the police and they're online and you don't know who they are so you don't know what their motivation is actually having someone like nick adley actually standing up for police and going no i've looked at this and that's yeah. is the kind of backup that you need in order for police to continue to be able to do the good work they're doing on social media and i'm not sure i don't think that giving it to a corporate team and to oversee it is always necessarily a good idea because they will see a negative reaction or a, a, a backlash as being something you need to worry about. It isn't always. I think it's the right people in your comms team. Sorry, just to put in there. Um, I, I am seeing, you know, the different types of personalities in police comms in particular. Um, or in comms generally, it is, there just seems to be this fear factor of, you know, oh, just don't, like somebody said to me, we're quite bland and beige with our social media. And it was like, why? And it was a police team. Um, and they said, we just don't get into trouble. And I think, like mm. you said, Nick, if if we had other chiefs like Nick Adley, you probably would do a bit more what Harry was doing because you've got that support. Um, but to think that you're going to be dragged into a comms team and shouted at or whatever, which isn't the way to deal with there it. Is, there is there is a... I, I... I agree with you, though, in the aspect of, yeah, some training would be good, even if it's just attracting. And I say to people, take photographs, get colours. It doesn't have to be a photograph of the whole scene. You need to be sensitive where you take that photo. But to highlight the air ambulance that's landed, take it from ground level. Phenomenal attraction rate I got because it was all distorted. Back doors were open, but it was no longer a serious injury. So I could do that. It wasn't making something out of serious like that. When it goes wrong, if you like, when two people have complained out of 30,000, which was the the um, reach that I found that that complaint had had, um, it's sort of, OK, How could, is there a way we can avoid this happening in the future? Uh, and it's very much an educational thing. You can do that with the comms. My fear with some comms is that comms tend to run the force in other forces because they are the experts and they tell the chief what you really shouldn't be doing that. The chief is tied because the chief is like, do I have five more cops on the street or do I have three more or five more people in comms dealing with all the comms side of things? It's a real tough question where they could be criticised and whatever. So there's that, that aspect as well. What's interesting for me is, and we, we, we sort of touched on a spectrum of what's important for, because policing has to have a strategy around its messaging and, and various other stuff. But I, I sort of call that temp, tentpole content. So that's the sort of repetitive content that when we go on holiday, you see on your doorstep in terms of stuff, flyers, you'll pick up flyers and advertising and various different things. And you don't really engage with it, but you might pick it up and read and, 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 go, and go from there. And, and the comm side of policing doesn't seem to see on the corporate side much in the way of engagement. Now, social media for me is two way conversation. It's all about engagements. People want to engage that's the whole reason why they're on social media and if the conversation is top down and one directional I, I think you switch off you lose your engagement ratio and I think that's where the accounts like Harry have a an advantage when it comes to the engagement because actually Harry you were always looking to engage with your followers and and I think that is often missed with the corporate accounts and and, and essentially that they, they they stick to, to that tempo content which yeah is, yeah I've, is a switch off 
It's, it's funny you've just reflected what Kevin Campbell Wright has just asked on the question. Questions. It says isn't it just about contact, but about listening to the conversation. He runs a community Facebook yeah. page, yeah. and it's very much the organic conversation that goes on, which is so useful about with social media and getting a real discussion. Um, but get ready to to just lob the parachute out the window and jump out when it gets a little bit silly, because sometimes um, silence is golden. Um, and inevitably you get someone who comes in and says something because they don't like the police or they got arrested yesterday. And it's important not to, to bite with that. And it inevitably happens, unfortunately. But it's just steering your way around that, really, that is so, so important. And I, and I think with the, the digital world, so often there's been a traditional bureaucratic way of speaking when, when, when police officers are delivering press conferences or whatever it is, you know, characterised by formal and impersonal tone. And and the digital world is not about that. It's all about authenticity. It's all about the people. And, and we've seen Cressida doing some really good work with the Met, doing some informal style interviews. She was at Lewisham Police Station just yesterday or the day before, and it, it was very authentic. And you start to get a real sense of of Cressida and, and, and what's behind her and, and, and her messages. And, and I think we need to see more of that in the digital world. And again, the personal accounts deliver that because we get to know the face behind the name. As a society, we're really interested in other people. That's why Gogglebox does well, or Big Brother, or Love Island, whatever. It's, it's just that in, insatiable appetite uh, to, 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 to really get an insight into other people. And, and what social media has done is we can touch and reach out and, and, and connect with, with our celebrities. People can talk to, to Nick, for example, and, and, and Nick is you know someone's hero, and, and, and that's special. And for a lot of people, police officers are, are just that. And, and, and it's it's a love you know that that's what breeds that reassurance and trust is is that 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 communication that ability to to, to reach out and, and have contact and, and i think that the corporate accounts kind of eliminate that yeah and I've, I've always said the best thing about twitter for me is that i can have a little influence on those who have a lot of influence so you've got the shop window where you are discussing with stuff with the public and and getting involved with conversations but the private messages the direct messages the rooms in the background are just bustling with people in different areas um, where it's really informative get a lot of information um, but also you can talk to like you say you can talk to people like Nick and you can talk to politicians and you talk to all sorts of people in their field and I remember the policing minister uh, she's our Northern Ireland secretary um, shadow policing minister she phoned me up because somebody said you need to speak to Harry about this, about the police pursuits and why if they do dr drive according to their training, that's not always enough. They'll end up in court. Um, and she didn't get that initially. A uh, 20 minute conversation in the field outside the ARV centre. And then she sends me a link to the Times interview that she did the following Monday. And it was pretty much our conversation. So, I mean, that's phenomenal, isn't it? You can't get better than that. Yeah, I think I think you're absolutely right, and and I think another good point to make is it doesn't matter if you're based in Devon and Cornwall, or mm. London or Staffordshire or Lincolnshire, wherever it is. If you're a roads policing officer, as you were, Harry, well, you were a, a, an armed response officer who happened to do some roads policing as well. Due to the, the oh, oh, he was, could I just say he was snow commander? Oh, snow, snow commander. commander! Can you say it in your voice again, Nick? Because I'd yeah. Snow commander. Oh yes. I've ribbed him ever since about that. <laughs> I've secretly loved it. Did you do any uh, online training for that, Harry? Uh, no, no. Some pretty odd. Uh, no, I, I, I'll bore you with that. That's a whole comms thing on its own. That yeah, is. but and that was interesting in itself, actually. When because when when the, we had the snows and that the, all the roads in and out of Devon were pretty much locked up and people were getting stuck on the motorway. During that time, Harry's social media letting people know, look, don't get to these roads, don't try down these roads, this area of Devon's really locked up, we're dealing with that at the moment, don't head out tonight if you think you... That's actually all really, really good good uh, stuff that people then passed around, and you were getting retweets and uh, and forwardings that coming from that account in a way that they weren't with, with corporate... Um, um, with, you know, corporate accounts, and that's that. I think that's really interesting because a personal relationship um, uh, feels like you're engaging with a person you know. It's almost like a local Bobby kind of thing, rather than the corporate account, which actually just feels like it's like in military circumstances. You know that 
veterans will talk about how they hate the MOD, but they love the army. Yes. Unless you're in it, you don't know the difference. And actually, the, these personal comms have a very similar thing. The other thing I find fascinating is you'll know this, Tom, that you know, in Formula One, somebody who's actually been there and done it is a useful commodity. And all teams will actually have former drivers and champions and people involved. Ross Braun, who actually was a was a team manager and a great engineer, has now gone on to be in, in command of Formula One. And like someone like Harry, who is the Ross Braun of uh, armed response vehicles. Um, although, to be honest, Ross Braun's carrying a few pounds and Harry's like a racing whippet. I saw him the other day. But, um, but it, it, like, he's actually out there and able to come in and join in and talk of this. Why isn't he being used by comms team? You know, he's, he's had extensive experience on how to deal with it and, and, and what things of people will respond to. But he's not being asked to come in and be part of the teams that are dealing with this. And that, I think that's... that's there, is a, there is a problem as well, and I'm not saying it's my force, but some, some forces are <clears throat> where the comms team are understaffed, massively busy. And so any... So if they can get through the day, they're happy, yeah? The chief is saying, hey, can we do this? Can we do that? And they're like, whoa, we can only just keep the lid on what we've got. Even if it's good news or bad news, if you've got the, pe the wrong people in any line of work where they haven't got the motivation or they just haven't got the, 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 the numbers to deal with any more information, then that, that, is, that is a problem. And it comes back to that, you know, I wanted to hire another 15 cops, but I can't because I'm split. Do I need more people in the comms team? Um, and again, I'm sorry to be talking so much, but it's just it's, when I was in news and I was working as a news journalist in a newsroom, um, uh, be, probably because I didn't go the normal way into news, I'd actually read the journalist guide to law back to front about 30 times. So I, the people would ask me, and I, and I, so we'd get an interview in, and I'd say we're going to run this. And news editors be going to talk to the lawyers first. I well, we're perfectly fine on this. Every time I ring the lawyers, they get, no, you can't run that. I go, yes, yeah. you can. no, you can't. It's a, it, it's like it, it there, it's a pre, it's prejudicial. No, it's not because the case, the case isn't active yet, or that's slanderous. No, it's not. It's a reasonably held belief by the person involved. He calls him an idiot. That's not detrimental. That's his own uh, only opinion. If he called him a thief, then you couldn't say it. So I'd have to argue with the lawyers because their natural state of being is. No, you can't run that because that way they don't have any problems. They never get into difficulty. Comms teams are very similar with 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 uh, with chief constables. Could we do this? No. Should we respond to that? No. Let's just back down and apologise. That's not the way forward. No, I I, I'm going to. I'm, can I jump in here because I feel like we're on a platform for comms people, comms hero, and um, I don't want to get as you know all of us slating comms team, because we're not that bad, Harry, you know this, because we, I am Harry's publicist, so I am going to big him up a little bit, but we do chat and we do talk about how you say you've got the freedom now to do things and we look for opportunities. But one big thing for me that I do not understand in the policing world is when officers retire after 30 years service and all that knowledge and experience, why are they not asked, like Nick said, to come back in, like Harry, to join the comms team? Because... You've got that experience and you've done that job. Mm. You you have that slant on it. So I think rather than slating the comms teams, can we add to those by bringing people like Harry and, and others in? That's my take on it and what I would do. I agree. I, the only context I'm doing, I, I'm making these comments in, in, in the context of the fact that individual accounts in, in various different forces, individual accounts are being closed down and being brought in under the umbrella account because we can't trust you to do it. What I'm saying is, unless you've got the knowledge of people like Harry sitting in the room so that you can turn around and say, why has he said this? this? This looks like people are complaining about what he said. Why has he said this? And Harry can say, well, because of this, this and this. Is that going yeah. to make sense? Are, are they closing them? But are, they, are they closing them because they're not trusted? I don't know. I, I didn't realise. Right. There's very, no, well, that's, it, it, it stops a whole load of complaint procedures and people involved in in those because it's still they'll say it's very quick system yes but a very quick system for each complaint on social media is still quite intense it said it needs eventually it needs an adult to have a look at it and say i'm sorry this is ridiculous you know um you know twenty eight thousand people disagree with you however <clears throat> yeah um i think uh the the problem yeah i was going to say something but yeah going into that side of things they do these surveys and there are these sort of surveys that are put on the corporate sites to say, can we have survey of what you actually want? And of course, that doesn't necessarily reach 
Mrs. Miggins, who just loves to follow her neighborhood beat officer, her PCSO and her dog handler, but she's not following the force account. So she doesn't know there's a survey. And so the survey comes back that everyone wants just, um, they don't want these people who should be doing police work and shouldn't be tweetering away on their thing. How many times have I been accused of that? There was no time to do any Twitter when I was at work. The only time I did Twitter at work was when I was at a hurry up and wait situation where I could then put something out where I was stuck waiting for recovery or something like that. Otherwise, it was all done in my own time, quite frankly, because I I, I thought that, you know, there's ma- that much investment in policing. But yeah, I mean, it's it's horses for courses because some people are like, they want to make their money and go home because they've just had it from the media, from the public and all that at the moment. Also, um, also Harry, just don't listen to surveys. People always ask yeah. surveys how they should. You know, what sort of television do you want? We want more news, more documentaries. We really like quality dramas. Okay, so then you do a quality drama and two million people watch. You do Love Island and there's seven and a half million people watching. Yeah. <laughs> That's That's true. It's true. Surveys <laughs> tend to be loaded, the question. So when you look at results or data, data can be interpreted. It's too subjective sometimes, the data. Data is not always objective. And and I think that's something to be mindful of. Picking up on Sophia's point, it's, you're absolutely right. That corporate accounts and the corporate expertise and professionals behind those accounts do a remarkable job. And, it, and, it, and it's worth just touching on that. And I know Sophia is, is in that strand, but I've been in and, and seen firsthand just how difficult it is. And we've talked predominantly about social media, which is not digital marketing or or digital communications. It's just one strand of that whole umbrella. And Harry touched on everyone being stretched and and, and being short staffed and the communications in those hubs or or the expertise within those communications hubs are working tirelessly on the internal comms and also the external comms and all of the work that goes out around the other digital strategies around the other pillars. And I think social media, in today's day and age is is so time consuming. I always say, if you're going to take social media seriously, then you're going to have to be prepared to to invest a huge amount of time in social media. And I think we're just looking at Surrey Police now doing something around introducing uh, people that are are handling those accounts 24 seven now. I don't know if Harry's seen that or Nick or Sophia, but you'll see, Surrey on their Twitter. I mean, I don't have Facebook or, or Instagram. I'm not cool enough. Um, but I do do Twitter. And you'll see, written all over you'll see them saying, you know, hi, it's <laughs> Simon and Amber or or something like that. I'll, I'll be taking you through the night. And I think that's a big step in terms of yeah. communications because that's the first account that I've seen that is actually staffing people 24-7. Yeah. Brilliant. Yeah, that's what we need. That's what we need. We need that specific, specifically such a vast uh, audience out there for that. And to have someone who's specifically for that. But we all know, we, you know, we all stretch and so they'll be used and they'll be given another job and whatever. You know, it's tough times, isn't it? It's not going to be a perfect world. Um, but I'd like to see, <coughs> would you, Harry, I'd like to see the officers actually using those individuals. So if, you, if you're on a night shift and you're somewhere, have... A, a way of being able to deliver information oh, to yeah. those individuals. So, so that account becomes much more relevant in terms of it being live and having a heartbeat and really showcasing what the police are up to and, and, and that authenticity. I, I always, you know, when I go on ride alongs, I'm a big advocate and I've been doing various different things with Southwest BCU in the Met where we look at showcasing exactly what it is police officers are doing. And those accounts, I think, can be used, especially if they're being staffed now, to do much more in terms of showcasing the world of policing. Why does police interceptors do well? Why does traffic cops do well? Nick will know this. That they're shown in the biggest areas for revenue streams in terms of ad revenue streams and stuff like that those are those programs score really really highly and that's why they're repetitively shown at those times and the appetite's there and i I just think we we should have more not it, it, it can be as live but you know just more insight and transparency and it goes back to policing owning its own content 
Because we've got the reason that those are successful is because they're being, being watched by the silent majority, who are the people that come out and quietly get on with their lives and aren't on social media. They're not. They're not the people who are spending all their time on TikTok or Instagram or. Um, I mean, look, the last election is a very clear example of that. If you'd have gone by social media and what was going on, then we were looking at a very different result. Come the day, the result was nothing like anything anybody expected. Um, because Middle England had gone out and said, mm, "I can't do this, so I'm going to do this," and um, that is the same. Well, that's the same with you know, in terms of programming about policing. It's one of the difficulties that part of the reason I got active is because I was talking to police officers who were saying everybody hates the police. And that's not actually true. The trouble is that if you're in the police force, you are predominantly facing bad. You are coming face to face with all the people, all the bad side of society. And the few times you get to talk to the good side of society, it's to give them bad news. Very rarely do police officers walk down a road, knock on a door and say, I've just stopped in and tell you nothing's happened in your road this year. It, you know, you don't get that positive kind of thing. So there is a skewed view. And on social media, as I said, you've got a lot of a lot of angry people with axes to grind who will take the opportunity. I mean, oh, some of the comments coming up on the side here and they were saying, you know, people saying oh, on our social media accounts, we got so much abuse. Um, and very little positivity. People who actually had a positive view of it are quite happy with what's going on. They don't go online to tell you they're very happy about it. People who have an axe to grind with the police, if they find a social media account, will use that to grind their axe. <clears throat> this is why it's important when you actually have social media teams dealing with it, that you don't react to a response as being negative, even if it is negative, because it might be coming from a section of the community that have an axe to grind. And so... You know, I, I would say we come back to this point that we started out with. Trust the police, trust the officers, and as Sophie said, give them give them more training. Don't close them down. Mm. No, I, I agree. And just touching on the chat bar, there, there is a Q&A bar as well, which allows us to get questions up into the screen and answered by Harry, Sophia and Nick. Uh, one of those is from Emma. It says, I'm proud to be in comms, but how do you get other officers invested in comms to get this community led? content i right. find we can't get those frontline teams to give, no. to give those important that, stories that rings i hear that that's over and over again harry and you're gonna yeah and i know why because what's in it for them if it goes to a corporate account mm -hmm. if you have a personal relationship with the person you know mm -hmm. on the other end of the com so you know that uh, Jane and Fred are doing the social media tonight and you've got a per personal relationship and so then you're more likely to say oh i'm gonna get some good stuff for them tonight and this is it, it's easily forgotten as well because I've been to jobs, 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 jobs. And I thought, oh, why didn't I just get? A oh, I was really lovely. That 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 was a positive thing, and I just missed the opportunity. It is busyness. It is the fact that I I say to people if you know if you want to get good photographs, but they've got to be in an appropriate place at an appropriate time and things. And and officers are going, well, if I do that, it's not going to bring me any good. It's only going to bring me some harm. Um, yes, I used to email. Uh, the comms about some good jobs that were going on so they had that positive me message but I also had a statement to do and half a file that needed doing still and I, before I went home so you could sort of you got to give officers the motivation to 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 know that actually this feels good to do this and this is a positive and it's just another add-on to their to-do list so we already know yeah. officers are just being asked to do more and more and more and i've sat in briefings and listened to, to what it is they've got to do on top of all and, and and it is it is that challenge i think though there would be an appetite for the younger audience or the younger joiners yeah. in terms of those coming in at the bottom of the organization because ironically they're the ones that understand this world so well because they've been a part of it for, for so long and you know i'm forever i said i don't do instagram i mean i was the other day trying to to do an instagram story where you could put a link in or something like that and i've just not got a clue but you know i, I could go to a, to a 14 15 year old or now a 19 20 year old joining the police they'll be like ah, just just straight away and, and 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 just roll it out and we're talking about social media it's transformed the digital world in the last 10 years a bit like 
photography changed with the digital world. So what we were doing 10 years ago in terms of marketing and communications is now completely different today. And what we'll be doing in 10 years time is, is probably uh, completely different. And my granddad always used to say, well, ask the whiz kids. And, and those are the ones coming in at the, the, the bottom of the organization that have so much knowledge and experience to share on this topic. Sophia, do you think if you actually had someone like a Harry in every, uh, every one of those comms teams, that nice, then, Can you that then the people out on the ground would go, if I ping this in, like that, that someone like Harry's going to do something with it rather than it being a corporate thing. Do you know what I mean? I, I do think so, because I know me and Harry talked about how the comms teams work, um, because you've always said corporate comms. So I, I do think having someone like Harry in there, you, you know, you're trusted to other officers, um, you're one of them because I have heard about the divide between the comms teams and, to be honest, between um, uniformed staff and civilian staff. Um, it's the same in every industry, really. You do get your back of house and front of house divides. But if you have someone trusted like Harry or the other thing as well, like Tom, you were saying, the younger audience, I would say anyone who in the force really wants to do it, you know, like they might go out there and, and you've talked about why you know why we should do it it's basically for me the way i see it it's it's sort of replacing not like you can the bobby on the beat is the dig, is the digital version isn't it um where you're giving that information it's the person you know i know some officers around north yorkshire and things like that and you know them personally because they they, they're authentic they come across and and chat about what they're doing and their jobs like everybody else uses social media for their jobs um or the majority of them so i would say having anyone that is interested in it they're the best people to go to and say do you want some training on this you know some do's and don'ts and things like that um and some of harry's bad examples uh, and and <laughs> charge as well for people. Yeah, by the way, is, interestingly, yeah. just uh, interestingly, Tom, somebody just said this. You know, we say that like this is, is Joel S uh, Sampson um, uh, is saying we say that young people know how to push the buttons. They don't necessarily know how to converse with the public, um, and also the way that um, a an online specialist who's twenty three converses online isn't necessarily how speaking in a way that somebody who's on social media who's 45 or you know living in the countryside will will deal with it so it's that's why i think the combination of all the ability of young people yeah. in the comms team combined with somebody who is an officer who has been there and done it is, is the ideal combination um and i think then that person can become the focal point so again i keep using you as an example harry sorry about this but just an example if you had a harry connected with that team then other officers would go i'll ping this through to harry because I know that he'll run with it if he thinks it's worthwhile. I can't because I'm, it's snowing and I'm doing the snow commander <laughs> stuff right now. So I can't do everything, you know, Nick. And there was another question that said, were you a member of Snow Patrol? But I let that one go. <laughs> it, it's, uh, it, it's an interesting point you make there. And, and I think that it, it's almost like a sports team or, or, or a Formula One team. Everyone's got a different role. And I think that the... The communications hat, and I just alluded to it in terms of the digital world and how it's changed things, is that that spectrum of deliverables has has really expanded. And Sophia, maybe you can talk to us about some of the challenges that police comms or or or, or people that work in communications have faced. Because Nick, you made the point: what works for m me in terms of engaging on Twitter might not work for a recruitment drive looking at 18, 19, 20-year-old officers that, that that aren't, or potential officers that aren't on Twitter. They might be on TikTok or, you know, I've never been on TikTok. <laughs> I couldn't even tell you how to, to put a post on TikTok or what happens. But it, it, it's that type of, that, that it, we have pods of communities and they're sort of divided through demographics and age and, and, and different things using different platforms. And that whole spectrum is, is, is quite vast now. And I, I would not be comfortable trying to engage with, with, with certain audiences on certain platforms because I just don't feel that I've got the expertise. I, I think there's two-way education here as well where we're saying, you know, police officers can um, explain to the comms team how it works. I think it's the other way around as well, because I'm guilty of this. I would look at um, police 
Twitter accounts think, come on, why are you not replying to those? You could easily turn them around um, mm. or add a bit of personality. And then when I joined West Yorkshire Police um, and learned about the teams, there's like, I mean, they're a force of like 10,000 staff or something like that. They've got about three comms people and one yeah. dedicated to social media. And then I realized, how how can that one person 24 7 do twitter instagram facebook and the the just the avalanche of comments that come in and negative ones like you say nick the ones that really have an axe crying they're the ones that are shouting on there you you'd need like a dedicated team of like 10 i would say and that's just scratching the surface yeah. they're full time going through that and replying to not to all of them because some are just stupid, but um, mm. replying and, and giving them answers and things, it's it's crazy. Actually, Harry, before you answer, there's a really interesting follow-up here from Jules Loveland that says, training is so important, people need skills and confidence, but you'll never get buy-in from offices if they don't know what's in it for them. So maybe that's the starting point, the why. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, I, it it comes down to it all the time because they're busy and they want it. They just think it's probably going into the ether. This is the problem. And I think officers can help themselves as well by what I used to do if there was a, an incident that went on on a night shift. I would send a quick email to the comms team to say, "Oh, just to let you know, log number at this. It's it might catch a little bit of press attention. This is what you we know about it. This is what I probably wouldn't bother saying, but you probably promote this over to you. And they were forever grateful for that because what this is what uses those three of those three people's time up is when the press ring them and say, "Oh, there was a job about an escaped elephant in Paynton. You know, can, what what is that?" And, they say, and they've they're like they've got egg on their face because well, we don't know. And then they're searching and they think, you know, they're searching under elephant. And then it was a rhino, and so no wonder they didn't find it. And uh, you know, so it goes on. So this was constant. So I think officers maybe a little bit more. I think what the problem is, officers are so tunnel vision in the busyness of their day it's the gray area is the civilian it's not it's not of them and us it's a well they do other stuff that's not my stuff my stuff is here and and it's getting that sort of reputation maybe with personalities maybe with a little bit of um you know if it's a semi-corporate account just a department i always say stick your initials on there so at least people know they get oh our h is great it was him again he's out and about it's what? getting that personal personal relationships going what's good practice and, and mike's talked about it now sophia made a good point having several trained officers operating at the same time uh, the account is invaluable is in the mets they differentiate from that sort of brand strategy messaging and sort of corporate importance to now having uh, corporate, uh, sorry, communication teams within every BCU. So if you don't know the Met makeup, but they, they have BCUs, not boroughs, and, and they're the areas that, that that London's broken up into. And those communications teams now are staffed by officers. And we were just talking to one before we came online, Bryn, who's going to be the the voice of of Lambeth. He he he's a fabulous candidate. But but now I know, having been to Lewisham and having been to South West BCU, so Kingston, those communication teams are now staffed by officers, and I think that's really really important and and a really good step forward. And and the reason I've mentioned that is because I think it, you know we talked a lot about some of the things that don't happen. I, I think the Met have actually done something. Good, uh, that's good practice there and, and, and could be shared. I think that's a good idea as long as the officers that you're bringing are senior officers who have been there and done it and have an interest. It, interestingly, bringing in junior officers who haven't necessarily spent that much time on the beat yes. uh, and in amongst it, they might be much better with comms and tech and all that kind of thing, but they might not necessarily have the depth of experience you want. And I think this is where you miss out on the opportunity to use uh, people who have gone into retirement or early early retirement. I I interesting here, Mike Panna has just said that um, Sophia made a great point. Having several trained officers operating off the same account is invaluable. Some police accounts have 10 people with access. All pitch in when required. That's actually a really good way forward. My worry at the moment, Sophia, and you, I, you maybe you can answer, I don't know how much you're aware of this, but there are forces that are closing down and telling their officers they can't have personal accounts and it must all go through the comms team. Tom, you'll be aware from the Formula One, and, and you, maybe I'm a lot older than you, so I remember specifically, but John Todd and, um, and uh, Ross Braun talking about when they came into Ferrari to create the Schumacher era, they said, what was the major problem? And he said, well, 
But so one of the major problems was between one race where they messed it up and the next race, they spent two weeks talking about whose fault it was rather than fixing the problem. I get the feeling at the moment with social media, there is a sense in some forces of trying to find out whose fault it is and not letting them near it rather than saying, how do we go about actually getting a better common team? And where you see it happening, where you've got, like Mike mentions, 10 people on call, senior officers who know what they're talking about, who've had some media training, who can actually, under pressure, come in and start dealing with it, or the officers know they can contact, because all officers have secret little groups and WhatsApp groups and whatever. Then you actually get that, you know, that would be a way forward and attach that to the comms team, and you've actually got yourself and start trusting your officers. But, and also, though, it's not if something goes wrong, it's when it goes wrong. Because yeah, I, I said to mine, I said to um, mine, as I say, I can't praise my guys uh, enough. They they went through a lot to keep me up there. Um, but I said to them where with uh, um, it's, it's like if you've got more than 4000 followers, then bin it because you'll get you'll get much more complaints after that. Just because of the volume of people that are going to see it. And the way it spirals out. And so if you haven't got many followers, if you're an officer, that's fine. And I'm, I'm being tongue in cheek there. Of course, I am. I'm being a bit sarcastic on that. But it's absolutely true. Your complaints start spiraling. And it's not necessary. OK, you can look at it out of context. You go, oh, God, yeah, that was I was tired. Yeah, it sounds a bit bad. And that's how you go back to the comms. And say, yeah, got that one wrong. Oops, sort of thing. And it's not as long as it's not malicious, it's negligent, it's dishonest or something like that, then then they should really be, okay, well, let's give this another go. And there's a, a push also to actually keep accounts local. So, so that having 4,000 followers is dreamy. That Some of the, the, the accounts now, they, they just want, you know, 20 people living in, in, in three roads of the local area. I, I don't see the point in that. You know, I learned a huge amount from Harry, and there's, there's an officer, uh, I think it's Cheshire Sergeant TCS, who does the Project Edward stuff around road yeah, safety. Yeah. Then there's Andy Cox at Lincolnshire, who's, who's nationally leading for, for road safety. More people are killed and seriously injured on, on, on the roads uh, than any other, um, you know, anything that might happen to you. So, so, and that's so important. I mean, imagine if you were just so narrow minded that you, you know, Andy Cox or whoever it was in Cheshire could only talk to, to sort of the hundred people that, that were in that neighbourhood that, that they happened to. Let me, and let me just get in because this is so important. I don't care what all the statisticians say and I don't dislike them as much as it may come across because I'm usually arguing with them. But it's so difficult to measure positive stuff. You don't know how many people have followed Twitter and followed officers' stuff and gone, do you know what? I was going to join the fire service, but I'm going to join the police. Do you know what? I think it's fine. Yeah, you have some hard times, but actually, they're, you know, blah, blah, blah. You can't measure that. You can't measure the positivity. They'll say, oh, yes, you can if you do. No, rubbish, you can't. You can measure negative stuff because it's all complaints. No, this is a we've had so many complaints. We had, like... Nick said they don't ring up and say, "Oh, just to let you know, I think you're brilliant." You oh, know, this, is, this is my favourite thing when I'm actually talking to people in the court about the courts and about the the the, the weak sentencing of people who uh, attack police officers or whatever, and and and, they, and he co they always come back with, you know, well, incarceration. We know that incarceration doesn't work. We can bring a show at the reoffending level. <laughs> I go, okay, where's the figures for the number of crimes that were committed whilst they were locked up? Yes, exactly. It gives us all a break. Where's your problem? <laughs> You can't measure the number of crimes that weren't committed whilst they were locked up. No, well, we knew, and we knew we're every briefing. I won't go on to a spiral here, but every briefing we'd be at our uh, Jim Jones is uh, released on Monday. Okay, well, we knew to go into the residential areas because he'd be burglaring, and you'd be sat on some blubbing old ladies. Harry's off on one. I am. It is. I'll come. I'll bring it back. <laughs> We're running Nobody out of time. Nobody cares. We're yeah, running out of time. Here and taking it back. No. Um, I've kept it to to the end because it is a bit of a contentious subject, and and we've seen as there's been that power grab to bring accounts in house, a, a real rise in the number of non accounts, and. There's some anon accounts that are absolutely fabulous, and there's UK cop humour who who permanently keep me keep me amused, and there's some the tree cop, for example, in terms of you know their focus on well-being, and 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 some of the other accounts, their insight is just second to none. But there is just uh, on the other side one or two accounts that could be 
challenging too much or being a little bit too divisive. And I think that's uh, quite an interesting area to talk about. And I'll open that up to Harry. What are your thoughts on that landscape? I don't know. Oh, I'm going to take it over to Nick, silence. and then I'll come back to me. <laughs> All right, I'll, tell you what, look, I'll go first because this is a really challenging area, especially for anyone who's actually uh, in the police. You're absolutely right. Some of them are absolutely fantastic. Some of them uh, drift far, far too far, and uh, you can tell in some of the accounts where police who have had tough careers are now that they're out of the force are working through some of the anger they have over opinions that they held over a period of time. When you're out of the police, you're able to say vocally, you're a lot able to say more about what you felt than you were when you were in the police. And sometimes that shows up some pretty old fashioned ideas that I'm not very comfortable with as well. And, you know, I've had these discussions with, with, with Harry where I've said, have you seen this account? That's really not appropriate. And I, you know, I have to look at the account and all the things that are being said on things that I take an interest or even am following on social media. Because the moment somebody says something that's inappropriate on there, I've got to be out of there and, and because otherwise I'm associated by just simply uh, following. And so I've got to, it's quite difficult to keep uh, attached to things because you have got to watch out. The moment says somebody sa says something inappropriate, you've got to go, sorry, that's not a, that's not a group I, I, I can be involved with anymore. You're holding bad views. Mm -hmm. So you have to pick and choose on those. Undoubtedly, there are accounts in there that are very good and actually speak to, and when, you know, when you've got the, when you've got the national media having a go at you, when you've got government having a go at you, when your own chief constable doesn't appear to be supporting you, it can feel like a pretty lonely place. And some of these accounts uh, uh, give um, some of those police some sense of home. But, but, but you know, some of them are pretty edgy and, and some of them are step way over the line and I don't think are appro appropriate for serving officers to follow. So you've got to pick and choose. I'm, I'm yeah, go, go for it. Um, I will confess that I can't do two things at once. I was reading the question on the right-hand side, and that's why I skirted it across the neck. I knew but, it. <laughs> uh, I will say, I will say, and I've had this conversation with all three of you, and the fact that when I left the police, I found very little difference. I thought it would be like, yeah, freedom, freedom. Nobody likes a ranter. They just rant off on something. It's boring. You know, it's extreme. It's like nobody likes that. They still like quite a balanced response, but an honest response. Um, Nick, working for the BBC, he's got to behave in a certain way. He's civilian. Um, Tom, yourself as, uh, you know, BT Sports presenter, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You can't be saying these off the thing. And, and, and to be honest, so I think you've still got, and I think it's a healthy level of, um, and I certainly know I've been speaking to you, Sophia, on that subject. It's that healthy level of just bring it down so it isn't, you don't get your emotions into it too much, uh, that you do have balance, but you are honest with it as well, that it's not a, just a bland corporate response you're going to give as well. And those people who do just rant off, they lose, they lose their audience and they'll just keep a very, a very intense sort of attention from a small part of that audience i think but there are a select few that do have tens of thousands of followers and the media do follow them and we've talked about policing it's a bit like being a goalkeeper no one talks about saves you make but as soon as you let one through your legs yeah, it, yeah. Everyone, everyone has to know yeah. about it and even you know these police officers i mean they can do extreme damage and the media that there are people there waiting for these accounts to, to make mistakes and say the yeah. things that they say. Sophia, if you, if you're in policing, how do you address this situation? That's a challenge. Ooh. I'll put you on the spot. Um, <laughs> never lost for words. Yeah. I was actually thinking of good and bad, um, police accounts and what I'd use as an example so at the moment if if serving or retired officers come to me and say how how should I do my social media that's some of the questions I get um I do give them example accounts um I won't give the example the bad ones but I will say one it's not even just a pet hey it's just horrible to see I've noticed a lot of retired officers have a go at current serving police and um forces and i think that's ridiculous yeah yeah I agree. I I agree with you with as a police supporter on the outside it's so hard to sometimes battle the tide and then you've got police officers turning yeah. Yeah. Police officers. Yeah. what are you doing 
Um, and why did you do it for 30 years if you hate it that much? Is, is the that, question that's I always ask. So but, my, um, go on, sorry. See, I think that the more this gets regulated and the more controlled and, 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 and the, the wider the power grab in terms of a social media footprint, I, I think we're going to see more accounts. I, and, and I think this is a, a problem that policing didn't see coming and I think is actually going to grow in terms of actually get better. Well, I agree. And in actual fact, and again, Mike Panett's making the point that, you know, you know, half um, half the police force is embracing the 21st century and half are going back to the Stone Age. With, with the result, the people who would have been uh, had a, had their face on it are starting a non-account. Yes. Well, they're a lot harder to deal with if you've got an anonymous account than you actually, if you are embracing your officers and encourage them in the right direction, this where they cool. are controllable. That's, you know, yeah. it, it, it's, a, it's a double-edged sword and it's a, it's a bad although, thing to complain. Although you, you've got the... Um, the Met Skipper, who I know very well, uh, and um, so he's a positive anonymous account, mm. and uh, that's even better in a way, in, in a way, in a cheeky way, because they're sort of distanced away from the police force. But as mm. long as they're positive, they can stretch the line a little bit. They can answer in a way they probably wouldn't have if they were a named officer. So you do have those. They're very few, and you've got to be very skilled to do that. Yeah. Is but it a bit like Banksy of the police world? Yeah, it is, isn't it, really? <laughs> it is. It is. Yeah. Right. I'm aware that we're coming up to 3.15. There's been loads of wonderful comments. Nafisa has just said so much of what's been discussed here can be applied to other sector, sectors. You know, a, a great session. Thank you. Um if anybody has any quick comments or any quick questions, please please do tap away in in the chat bar or or forever hold your peace. But you know, from my perspective, I, I think today's conversation has gone in incredibly quickly, and we've covered what is a really broad spectrum in terms of communication. We talked a lot about social media. I, I, you know, I, I really do think social media underpins the digital world in terms of communications, but there are other forms of communications, email and, and various other things. But is there anything else that you'd like to add, Nick, in terms of our conversation today? Just interesting that somebody, uh, Bryn has actually asked, can we hear more about the escaped rhino, which I think goes back to um, uh, Harry's story. Yeah, Harry turned, out to, turned out to be a small kitten. Yeah, Harry is in fact in retirement. Uh, the rhino, he's thick-skinned, horny, and can charge anything he likes. <laughs> and you, you've got an evening coming up, haven't you, Harry? You've got various evenings coming up where you can listen to Harry talk about all his stories. And that, you know, from my perspective, going out with policing, the, the stories that I've picked up, and I only, you know, I go out once in a blue moon. Police officers are out there 24-7, 365 days a year. And the things that you see and do and the stories that you have are, are just, yeah. people just can't believe it. Yeah, and I will unashamedly thank you for that. We've got a YouTube chat, chat with Dave Wardell at 4 o'clock on a Saturday on YouTube. And um Twitter, Facebook, and and that is really good. We've got um, Superintendent uh, Angela Quinton, people like that who are in really good places, positive people from various, and we have the man for an hour, and so it'd be lovely to see other people there. Thank you for that. Shame. Oh, yeah, I've, just put, I've just put the web link in there, so if anyone wants to see where Harry's touring and his frontline chat links, they're in there. You and should work in there. And everything yeah. else. <laughs> you should work in Thank PR you. and communication, Sophia. Yeah, she'd be good. <laughs> but I, I, one, of, one of the last things I'd say in terms of communications is it's very difficult for the police at the moment, and they do feel under. Uh, I know that police officers feel really, really uh, uh, under attack from many different areas, um, and it's a tough job to do at the best of times, anyway. But I'd go back to that thing where it's very easy to believe that everybody's set against you. In actual fact, the the the, the quiet majority um, are very much on your side. It's just that they're not very vocal about it, and. Um, a lot, a lot more people understand and value what you do than uh, the. So I'm trying at the moment. I've been trying to get the police bravery awards uh, on television because I think if people saw those awards and the stories that go with them, um, I think it would be. Uh, I, I think that would engage the public even more. And all of that social engagement, whether it be through television and telling those stories, gives the gives the general public a much better idea uh, of what officers do on a day to day basis. I, you know, I always I've said it a few times that. Yeah, an officer will kiss their kids good good night tonight, and then go out on patrol and be walking through doorways into God knows what and breaking up fights and 
or you know like yeah. all the different things that they do and risking risking their lives on a daily basis for all of us and it's people just simply don't know there's much more support than you believe uh, and much more appreciation for what you do which is um why i stay involved for the moment and um Although I tend not to get invited to the Police Bravery Awards anymore because I think I've upset a couple of chief constables over the time. <laughs> did, did they not use to screen that on telly? Because I, unless I dreamt it, I thought when I was younger I used to watch something to do with police bravery or was that just generally brave people? And various different things. I'm going this year. So if you are there, Nick, it, it'd, be, uh, it'd be a pleasure to catch up. But yeah, I, 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 We'll have an orange juice together. Yeah, I echo your thoughts. I mean, my journey into policing started eight years ago. I didn't know anything about policing bar the odd traffic stop and what you saw on TV and read in the newspaper. I was just amazed to see what went on. And, and actually, I came away compelled to tell the policing story. And that's what was the catalyst to, to what is where I'm at today, because what you see and what you think you know is just not what is actually out there on the front line. And I've met so many wonderful men and women who I'm proud enough to, to call friends now who go out and do, do, do an incredible job. And I use my social media channels, if you follow me, when I do go out on ride-alongs, to actually tell the story. What are the challenges? What are the tensions? What are the officers facing? How did they feel in terms of what it was they were going to, to deal with and especially in in parts of london where where i've been it's it's been unimaginably challenging so i think if and that's why we're here we're passionate about social media media and communications but we're passionate about policing we're passionate about getting the truth out there and i think we can do so much good work in the media and communications arena to, to be able to really showcase uh policing in in, in a much uh, in a much better light can I just say, Tom, um, you are one of the good examples that I use to follow on Twitter and how to do police social media really well. You and um, John Sutherland. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Thank um, you. So, yeah, I thought I'd share that. And thank you for hosting this. Uh, you did a great job. Thanks to everyone else. And I just wanted to say sorry on behalf of Nick Adley, who um, struggles with his connection. I think it might have been a firewall with the police. So um, that was a shame, but we are looking at doing something similar um, to do with police comms and generally different police topics. So I hope you guys would be involved. I know Tom and Harry have been chatting about it, so we will um, get those details out soon. It's been an enjoyable chat, everybody, and I'm just pleased that um, we're going to finish, finish on such an upbeat in such an upbeat way with Harry's song. So take it away, Harry, yeah. when you're ready. No, I haven't got time because I was just going to say how amazing it is. Sophia's managed to do this as well and land aircraft the whole time as an air traffic controller. So thank you very much. Cheers. <laughs> Multitasking. Yeah. Well, listen, just to wrap that thanks up, enough. thanks, Nick. Thanks, Sophia. Thanks, Harry. But but mainly thanks to, to everyone who's who's tuned in for, for all your questions and, and, and for whatever it is you're doing today. And, and the talks that you're tuning into. Thanks again for, for, for the positive comments. And, and I hope you continue to enjoy your journey into comms here. Yeah. Thanks, guys. Um, are you going to be shooting off? or Because we do have a social lounge where you can jump on the tables if anyone's got any questions that we haven't managed to answer. Um, it's fine if you need to go. Harry, I'm retired now. Huh? You could I'll probably stay up. back and chat to everyone. So yeah. Harry will definitely be there. Nick and Tom, if you have got time, because I know you're really busy, um, please I can hang around. Um, Thank you. I have to go because I have to go and get my ears waxed. <laughs> <laughs> what are you glamour. doing before and after? It's a glamour of uh, TV. No, it's one of the things about wearing earpieces in your ear all the time. The waxing. I, I have the same thing, Nick. And if you go swimming, it's even worse because then you get water oh, yeah. in your ear. Guys, I've just done it. I've got something off eBay. It's completely safe and it cleared me completely. It's amazing. <laughs> yeah, no, that's, 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 that was for free, everyone. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I thought that was uh, that thing you bought is for use at the other end, Harry. Don't, <laughs> it's completely worth it. End this session, everyone. <laughs> Thank you so time. much. Um, we'll head to it's the social lounge if everyone wants to see us there. See you, Sophie. Bye. 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 Bye.